Good afternoon. Good, night. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Laredo College. We're going to start this very unusual event. Thank you, everybody, for coming to Laredo College. Yes. We are honored to have such an event this, this morning. This is the first time where we have the Texas Tribune come to Laredo to be able to have a dialogue, a dialogue with our state representatives to discuss the economy, to discuss the future of Texas, and more importantly, the role that Laredo, the region that we play in our economy. And we look forward to having a great dialogue and discussion. First of all, I would like to uh, recognize my board very quickly, the, the chair of my board, Judge Mercurio Martinez. And we have two other trustees as well. Ms. Cynthia Mares, well, the and Ms. Tita Vela. And of course, we, I want to like to welcome any, all the other visitors and representatives and future participants in Laredo College on the board as well. Anyway, this has been an exciting time for us. We've been, this event has been in the workings for over a year. And since Laredo is a forward-looking institution, we're very excited that now the state of Texas and the Tribune is recognizing the role that the community college has with our people, with our students, and more importantly, with the programs and skills that we provide with our citizens and especially with our industry. With that said, I know we have a, a very unique, a very intense discussion this morning. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it to Mr. Smith, who is our speaker and our dialogue taker this morning. Mr. Smith. Thank you very much. Mr. President, thank you so much. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Evan Smith. I'm the CEO of the Texas Tribune. I have the pleasure of being the, uh, uh, to lead the conversation today, to be uh, the, the host of this of sorts. Uh, I'll introduce our speakers in a second. Uh, we at the Texas Tribune uh, travel around the state of Texas all year long to do events like the one you're about to, uh, to witness with elected officials, public figures, people in positions of responsibility and power in the state of Texas who decide through their work things that ultimately affect you, people who cast votes, who make the decision to spend tax dollars, and who set policies that affect people in Laredo and Webb County and all over the state of Texas. We have a problem in Texas that most people don't pay attention to politics, don't pay attention to the legislature. We, in fact, have the worst voter turnout in Texas of any state in the country over the last four election cycles. But everything that happens during an election and everything that happens during a legislature is important and it affects every single person in this room. And so we travel around with folks like the ones we have here with us today to talk about the important work that affects you and hopefully get you more engaged and more involved in a regular conversation about these big issues. Now we come to college campuses over the lunch hour because they're wonderful partners in this effort to get the public engaged. And of late, we come to community colleges and all the uh, uh, places we go because these are the true public squares of our communities. People do not know that more than 50% of the enrollment in higher education in Texas is in community colleges these days. And we need to support community colleges with our presence on these campuses because this is the future workforce of Texas. This is the future population of Texas, and this is where important conversations about the future of Texas have to take place. So to Dr. Solis, to Dr. Rodney Rodriguez, Obed Guerrero, to Ricardo Iniguez, and to Fabiola Rodriguez, and everybody associated with Laredo College, please give them a big hand for being such wonderful hosts and partners today. We appreciate you, we appreciate the board and the hospitality you've shown us in having us come to Laredo today. And it is wonderful to be outside of Austin. Austin, as you know, is fake Texas. Laredo is real Texas. And so we've left fake Texas to spend a little bit of time in real Texas today. And thank you for having us. All of our events are free to attend. We provide lunch um, to get you to come and to be part of this day. But sponsors make it possible for us to be here. Please join me in acknowledging Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Texas, Methodist Healthcare Ministries of South Texas. AT&T, PepsiCo, Walmart, Southwest Airlines, and the Hatton W. Sumners Foundation all support this event. Please give them a big hand and thank them for supporting us. 
And of course, any of you who are members of the Texas Tribune, we're a nonprofit public media organization. We certainly appreciate your support as well. Nine years of doing this work, and we appreciate the opportunity to report on behalf of Texas. If you're tweeting about today's event, either here or at home on the live stream, the hashtag is TT Events. We will do about 40 minutes of conversation from the stage. The balance of time will be questions from the audience, and then we'll send you all on your way by 1 o'clock. Okay? Now it's my pleasure to introduce the state legislators who've kindly joined us today. On my left is Tracy King, Democrat of Batesville, who represents House District 80 in the Texas House. He first won election to the legislature in 1994, lost an election in 2002, came back and won again in 2004, and has been in office ever since. Like all House members, he's on the ballot this fall, but he has no opponent, so he's effectively reelected. That's right. Congratulations, Representative. It's a pretty easy election, pretty bad election cycle, but pretty easy election. In the 85th session, Chairman King chairs the Agriculture and Livestock Committee and sits on the Natural Resources Committee. He is a native of Baytown. He grew up in Atherton. He has an undergraduate degree from Texas A&M University. On his left is Richard Pena Raymond, Democrat of Laredo, who's represented House District 42 since 2001. He previously served three terms representing House District 44. And between those two times in the legislature, he ran as the Democratic nominee for Land Commissioner of Texas. This fall, he too is up for re-election. Unlike Chairman King, he does have an opponent, a Republican, running against him this fall. In the 85th session, he chairs the Human Services Committee and serves on the Ways and Means Committee. He is a native of Alice, Texas, and he has an undergraduate degree and a law degree from the University of Texas at Austin. Please join me in welcoming Chairman Tracy King and Chairman Richard Pena Raymond. Thank you both so much for being here. Good to be with you. Let me, uh, let me begin by asking you both about the last legislative session. It is a memory in the minds of some, but of course it defines so much of what we talk about in this election cycle and in the next election, or in the next legislative session, it will really be as much about what happened last time as anything else. Chairman Raymond, let me begin with you. A lot got done in the last session, and a lot did not get done. Let's start with the first part, what got done. What was the most important thing that the legislature did last session in terms of the impact that it has on your district? Well, first, first of all, Evan, thank you very much, and thank you to the Texas Tribune for being here. Pleasure. Uh, at Laredo College. Until recently, it was Laredo Community College, but it's Laredo College now. Yes. And I want to thank uh, President Ricardo Solis for hosting us and for being a wonderful president. I've loved working with him. Uh, and, uh, and you continue to build what is a great educational institution into an even greater one. So we thank you and thank all the students and all the faculty and right. teachers who are here. Um, you know, there are so many important things that we deal with, Chairman King will tell you. Uh, but one of the things, when you become a chairman of a committee, obviously, uh, it, it, you, you focus a lot on those issues. I chair the Human Services Committee. One of the things that we have oversight of is the Medicaid, uh, Medicaid in the state of Texas, yeah. $30 billion a year. Uh, on top of that, I have, we have, the committee has oversight of the Department of Family and Protective Services. And one of the things that the governor made uh, an emergency issue was the issue of, of reforms in the child protective system right. in the state of Texas and the foster care system in the state of Texas. The kids in the state of Texas, 30,000 plus, who are in the most need, quite frankly. And we worked very hard on some reforms in that. And I, leading up to the last session, the speaker appointed a, a, a bipartisan group, which I headed, six Republicans, six Democrats, worked very closely with them and worked with my counterparts in the Senate. We passed legislation that that I believe will continue to build a system uh, in working with Commissioner Hank Whitman, by the way. Commissioner uh, of the Department of Family and Protective Services, Hank Whitman, grew up and born and raised in Hebronville. Um, I, his uncle is a friend of mine. I love working with him. He's a retired captain of the Texas Rangers. But we work together to build this system to take care of the kids who are most vulnerable in our, in our society and who have some of the toughest stories you could ever imagine. I'm proud of that, and we did it in a very bipartisan way. Right. I met with the governor specifically on that four times. I met with his chief of staff, Daniel Hodge, and right. staff many times beyond that. And we, and we passed good legislation. That was very important. There are a lot of other things that I could get into, but I wanted to mention that. In addition, the Medicaid system, the, it's a managed care system now. We continue to try to make that better because, again, that, 
That covers four and a half million lives in the state of Texas, and many, many uh, people in Laredo qualify for Medicaid and right. are under that system of health care. So I, I'm proud of the work we did in those areas. Uh, I'm very proud of what we tried to do in the Ways and Means Committee in trying to do something about property tax reform, and I think we're going to do that next session even in a well, more well, meaningful Well, let, let me come to Medicaid and property taxes in a second, because those are two very important topics, especially for this part of the state. Chairman King, to Chairman Raymond's point about the foster care overhaul, he is absolutely right that the legislature stepped up. It was one of the rare bipartisan issues in the last session. Democrats and Republicans coming together, but of course it had gotten to the point of being a crisis. It had gotten to the point of a federal judge basically saying the state has got to fix this problem because we've got foster kids sleeping in state office buildings. Sometimes it takes, Chairman King, crisis conditions for the legislature to act, does it not? Well, it, it does, Evan, and that's the human condition, I think. You know, I always tell people that that's human nature. Uh, people begin exercising after they have their first heart attack. And, um, and it's just the way that it is. And when you're, you know, the legislature is very, very careful with taxpayer dollars, and we're also always cognizant that those, the money that the legislature has belongs to the taxpayers of the state of Texas, and so we're, we're very diligent and, and try to be conservative about the use of those funds, and um, so a lot of times they don't proactively get ahead of things until Sometimes there is a crisis. Sometimes we wait until we need We wait to until you have solve, to do it, until, until as, a, as I said earlier, you know, until you don't have really a choice. But I will say that they do step up when there is a time to do it. They stepped up in that particular case. They've stepped up in other cases. And uh, quite candidly, there's some areas where I, I hope and pray that we can step up this next legislative session where there's some needs also. Yeah. Well, tell me from your perspective, same question as I asked Chairman Raymond, what was the most important thing that you think the legislature did in the 85th that affected your district? Well, certainly always one of the best things they do is they pass a balanced budget, um, which is something that our federal government is unable to do. Of course, and it's the only thing that the legislature is required constitutionally to do, is pass a budget and balance, right? That is correct. That is the only thing that we're required to do, and we have a prohibition against borrowing money um, for the most part, and so that keeps them uh, pretty conservative in the way they spend their money, but certainly that did. And what that does is it allowed us to address some of the crucial needs that we have here in Webb County and Zapata County and the other counties I represent, which is um, highway construction and those types of issues. Uh, even though it's never enough, we put additional money into those areas. We put additional money into uh, public education. There again, it's not enough. The next legislative session, we're going to have to address the retirement programs, the employee retirement system, and the teacher retirement system because, uh, bless their heart, they haven't really um, had a raise in a long time, and we need to do that. Yeah. To, to the Medicaid point, Chairman King, that, um, that Chairman Raymond brought up, Healthcare broadly is one of those topics that always looms large because it's such a percentage of the state budget. In fact, I think it's either risen to be or has slightly gone beyond as a percentage of the all funds budget what education has been over the years. Education was always the first, the thing we spent the most on. Healthcare has now risen to the point that it's almost a little bit beyond that. Um, we have along the Texas-Mexico border in this part of the state four of the five most uninsured counties in the entire country. This seems to be a problem that it would be in the legislature's interest to get ahead of. Why have we not done more with that issue? For all the good work that gets done, why have we not tackled, in your opinion, Chairman King, the health care problem in the legislature more than we have? Well, it is a number one cost driver in the state budget, and it's a number one cost driver in a lot of corporate budgets too, quite candidly, people that have large employee payrolls, and, and insure a lot of people, and it's just, it's money, Evan. I mean, it's just money, and uh, if we had all the money that, w that we would love to have and everything was available to us, we could make sure that everybody had adequate health care and adequate insurance, but it's, it's a money issue, quite simply, and the reason that it's more pronounced in this area is because there's a larger need here, but um, we, we still have the same funding issues that the rest of the state has. Right. Ch uh, Chairman Raymond, the larger need that Chairman King talks about is because there's more poverty in the communities along the border and therefore the need for the government to step up is, is greater? Yeah, but, but Evan, let's be clear. Um, part of why I believe you, you um, don't have an expansion, for example, if we want to call it expansion of Medicaid, 
Is there, a lot of our colleagues still are not engaged enough, I think, to understand how many of their constituents qualify for Medicaid. I'll never forget years ago, and, and Tracy will remember Leo Berman from Tyler, yep. and he got on the mi microphone and was opposing some amendment that had to do with Medicaid, and he said, my constituents don't use this program. And by the time he was finished laying out his argument, we pulled up the numbers. His district had the second most highest number of Medicaid participants in the state of Texas. Right. And so I think that part of what happens is it isn't just a border issue. No, there, there are all parts of Texas that people that qualify for Medicaid. So, Indeed. But I think part of the, the challenge, as it always is, is educating our colleagues how important it is and how much it affects their district. When they find out how much it affects their district, right. when, when now, for example, that nursing homes are having to go into the managed care, are, are covered by managed care, uh, Medicaid managed care, I've told nursing home owners, I've looked at the maps of where they have nursing homes and, and assisted living, I said, I've looked at your, where, your, where your locations are. You're in a bunch of Republican districts. You need to get whoever's running your assisted living facility, whoever's running your nursing home, to talk to my colleague who's a state rep, who's a Republican, and tell them about what the needs are in that community, because I right. promise you they don't know. But of course, the one thing that so many members of the legislature hate more than, than, uh, than almost anything is, is the government getting into the business of, of health care or any other issue. And the fact is we had an opportunity to expand Medicaid several years ago, which might have provided more dollars, Chairman well, King, right? That's to what the I was going to add, and, and, and Chairman Raymond brought up a vital point. I mean, in the state of Texas, the leadership in the Texas pretty much unilaterally made a decision that we were going to turn down a nine-to-one match on, right. uh, on Medicaid. And, and it's interesting when you sit around a coffee shop and you explain, uh, and I had that conversation a number of times with some of the most conservative members of your community, um, and they say, well, explain to me what that means. And I said, well, it's a nine-to-one match, one of our dollar, nine of the federal dollars. And they said, well, how long will it last? I said, well, I don't know, but for the foreseeable future, it will be there. And to the one, they always said, well, why did we turn that down? Why wouldn't we take the money? And I right. just say, well, you know, that's a question that you're going to have to ask the, the big the governor and the lieutenant governor and the leadership right. at that time. Right. Uh, Chairman Raymond, the other thing that, besides health care, really didn't get done in the last session and is a lingering issue for us has been school finance reform. We had 82,000 public school students to the state's uh, budget. Effectively, we educate 82,000 more kids into public schools each year. We're adding that with the population growth. Um, we haven't been able to arrive at a school finance solution that seems equitable or adequate in decades. And yet, in the last session, the opportunity came up to do something, and yet the legislature did nothing except kick it down the road in the form of another study. So can you try to talk about where we are on that issue? Well, you know, it, it, again, you know, you're looking, I, I believe, and, and I believe Chairman King would agree with this, you're looking at two examples of two Democrats that work very closely with all the members. We don't care if they're Democrats or Republicans. Right. But, but this is an issue where clearly um, there were enough Republicans that felt like they just didn't want to take that leap. What historically has happened in the state of Texas is until, getting back to your, I think, initial premise, until the Texas Supreme Court says, rules, you all have to do more, then the legislature doesn't do more. So no this, matter how this much was I the case it. where in the past the, the, the court put effectively a gun to the head of the legislature and said Absolutely. you have to fix it, but this last time they didn't. They did not. And so you didn't fix it. We all thought that, we, that that lawsuit would, you know, that we would prevail right. on behalf of the schools, but what happened instead was the, the Supreme Court ruled against the schools, but in their opinion said, but you ought to do more. Right, Chairman King, of course, the pushback that a lot of local elected officials say is there already is a voter check on those kinds of things, and that check is called elections. So if, if county commissioners or city council members or anybody else approve tax increases that the public doesn't like, they'll get voted out of office next time. They're voted into office to make those hard decisions on behalf of these communities. What do you think about that? I agree with that. I do. And um, I, um, I've never been a supporter of revenue caps um, or appraisal caps. Um, I've, I've always felt like that it, it really is just a, a way of avoiding the real discussion that, that we ought to be having about our, our tax system in the state of Texas. 
and um, and the folks that are running for statewide office and those types of things use that as a way to promise tax relief when in fact it, it really won't deliver very much well, in my, there is no that's my opinion. There is no statewide property tax. It is interesting to hear people at the statewide level campaigning on property tax reform when the reality is those property tax decisions happen back home. You all don't affect that really, right? Um, they, they will claim that they can affect your property taxes by revenue um, caps and those types of things, but I, I just don't think that's a permanent solution. Right. So you all have been in the legislature longer than most people you serve with. By my count, you're running for your 12th term in total, is that right? I think so. And you're running for your 13th term in total, yes, is that yes. right? So you all have really uh, stood the test of time in this body where the turnover happens much more quickly. And a lot of these younger guys who are agitating about this or that have really only been there a couple sessions. They don't remember what it was like in the old days. What's the biggest difference? Let me ask the two of you, old grizzled veterans. What is the biggest difference between the legislature you serve in now and the legislature that you served in then, Chairman King? Well, for the record, I think Richard's a few months older than I am. Um, yeah, but let's stipulate that you're both really, really old, so. But, um, we are both over 40, yes. And, um, you know, the biggest change that I've seen in the legislature is that, um, and it, it perhaps it's just wishful thinking or, you know, how absence makes the heart grow fonder and all of those kinds of things, Evan. But it sure seemed to me like when I first got there in the early 90s that there was a, a, a larger group of people that were concerned about what was good for their district and what was good for the state of Texas, and they were willing to cast a hard vote in order to get that and, 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 and balance a budget and come to the middle with something that everybody could live with. It just seemed to me like it was that way more so than it, now, than it is now, so the tone was different then. Right, there was a center in politics at that time in a greater, to a greater degree than there is now. There, I remember it that way, I sure do. Right. Is it true that you're the last Anglo rural Democrat in the legislature? Yeah, thank you. Um, um, the, my last constituent clapped right over there. Is that there. right? Yeah, no. Um, you that are kind of like a golden sheet warbler, aren't you? That, that is true, and I've declined every opportunity to do an interview. Someday I'll write a book about it. Yeah, this may be the last interview you do, so nobody else points it out. That's right. Um, Chairman Raymond, oh, that's what's actually the last rural one. Yes, last yeah. rural Anglo <laughs> yeah, Democrat. There are, and that, and, and that is true. Yeah, uh, Chairman Raymond, <laughs> what's the biggest difference between the ledge when you got in and now? You know, reporters used to be so much more thoughtful about the stories they would do in newspapers. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll take that. That's fine. Yeah. Now, but it is, but it is very hour, different. You know what the big? Yeah, twenty-four hour news cycles. 24-hour news cycles. That, we right. really didn't have that, and now we do. And it's constant, as yep. you know. And this is a wonderful example and a good example of, of, of where that has gone. And, and I think it's good. It keeps the public more engaged, more informed. And, um, and so I think it's been a good change. Holds you guys accountable, right? Do I know? <laughs> but let me, but let me tell you one of the things that I, you know, because people talk about this all the time. You'll get, oh, you guys, it's gotten really bad. It's like Washington, whatever. I don't agree with that. I, I don't agree with that. I, I, you know, one of the things I was taught by Senator Simon up in Washington before I left, he said, you know, if you always remember that everybody who's there, if you, because I told him I wanted to go home and maybe run for office, and he said, well, if you get into the legislature, he said, remember that everyone who's there in that office, in the House and the Senate, love this, your state, love this country. If you always remember that, then it's a wonderful place to start. And I've tried every year and every time I'm dealing with, with other members to remember that, to say they love this state as much as I do. We're not always going to agree on how to make it better, right. but we all love it. And then I remind myself, you know, the people that I love the most in the world, my parents, my kids, my wife, my brother, my sister, I've had some of the toughest and biggest disagreements you could ever have with anybody, but I still love them. So if I can do that with the people I love the most in the world, why can't I do it with guys that I work is it with? Hard, is it harder now, to Chairman King's point, that people kind of have retreated to one side or another and that makes it difficult? No, I think, you know, I, I, I don't really see it that way. I mean, we both do this. We go, you know, I know all 149 of the members and I know all 31 senators. And you get to know them at a personal level. I mean, I've had 
Shoot, man, I mean, I came out with a proposal last session that Michael Quinn Sullivan, who's not a member, but you know who Michael Quinn Sullivan is. He's an, an outside in, uh, endorsed, conservative activist. Yes, he endorsed my proposal to take $3 billion from the, from the rainy day fund and give it as property tax relief to residential homeowners for school property taxes. He endorsed that, and a bunch of Republicans did as well, and so did Democrats. I couldn't get it to the floor for a vote, the speaker, or whatever. For but whatever your point is you can put a coalition of people who don't agree on because things. Because if you sit right. down and reason with people, a lot of times you will come to an agreement on, on it may not be perfect, right. but you can move the ball forward. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, Chairman. and those, the, uh, Chairman Raymond's absolutely right. The, the men and women we serve with, they're all good, uh, reasonable people. They don't all represent districts that are good and reasonable, but, um, but the, you know, when they get there and they look at the real issues and they look at the budget and they understand the realities of what, what's going on there, um, then, you know, they, come, they can absolutely reason with you. Whether they can explain their reasons when they get back home is always a test. It's a different story. Love the sin or hate the sin. That's usually what happens. Um, let, let me ask you about the speaker's race. Um, so when you came in, Chairman, that yes, may sir. have been the last time that there was an open speaker's race, right? Was your first session the session that... There was an open speaker's race, right. but, we, that, we, but that, we've had two others since then. Well, but you <laughs> haven't had really open speaker's races. True. You've had an incumbent, incumbent speaker who, yes. has been, who has been deposed in right. favor of somebody else. Right. This is the first speaker's race in which there is not an incumbent speaker seeking that leadership post again since 1993. Correct. Today, uh, your colleague, Republican Four Price of Amarillo, announced for speaker, filed. He is the seventh candidate, six Republicans and a Democrat now, who have announced for this office. And I have to believe that like Congress, everybody wakes up in the, in the morning, 435 in the House, 100 in the Senate, they look in the mirror and they see a future president staring back at them. That all 181 look in the mirror and see either a future speaker, lieutenant governor, or governor staring back at them. Um, Chairman Raymond, what is your like uh, Las Vegas sports book analysis of this of, of this speaker's race? Well, I mean, the it, odds it, and, and the outcome is likely to be what? Well, first of all, let me be very clear about something. You you touched on it. I don't have any doubt I'd be a really, really good speaker, okay? You would be a I'd great be a speaker. Really, I mean, I'd probably be great. Are, are you filing? I'd probably be great. Well, yeah. no, because it's gonna be, a, it's gonna be a Republican. I, I, we're not, I, the Republicans will have the majority and we're gonna have a Republican speaker and I'm a Democrat. And so uh, I won't be filing for speaker. If we had a Democratic majority, I would. Um, I think that uh, what I can tell you is this, I don't know who the next speaker is gonna be, but I know the next speaker. These are all very good friends of mine, all, right. the, all the folks who have announced, all the folks who are contemplating it that, that I've heard of, anybody. Anyway, they're all very good friends of mine. They're good friends of Chairman King. We're going to have a good person in there. I don't, I don't have any doubt about it. You'll, you'll be able to work with whoever it is. I don't have any doubt about it. And I, I, right. I, we're, you know, we're really not supposed to talk a lot about the speaker's race. It's a member-to-member -member deal. I'll tell you because you're, you sort of touch on it and so, so that you'll know. I mean, I've committed to someone. I'm not going to say who. But you've committed to someone. I've committed to someone. You've in this committed race. to a Republican. Uh, yes. You have. Yes, I have. Why won't you say? Because they've asked me not to. This is a member-to-member -member issue, and they. I, t I called them. I said, "Look, I'm going to be on this." They said, "Wait, just just tell them you've committed, but don't tell them who." Fudge, fudge, in other <laughs> words. Right. Why why commit now if you don't know who else is going to get in? Because I, you know, I thought about it, and again, these are all they're all friends of mine. They're all good people. They are, Tracy will tell you, they're all good people. And I, I thought about it hard. It's been about a year since uh, Speaker Strauss announced that he was not going to run. Was, it was last, I think, October. That, that's, a, that's a long time. And I've met with everybody who's announced and some who hadn't announced. And we've sat and talked at my office or at their office or whatever. And I just came and to the conclusion that I felt I was, I was ready to commit to someone. Right. Will the Democrats d uh, uh, support a single candidate as a block? Well, if they do, I hope it's the one I'm supporting. OK. Chair, have you committed to anybody, Chairman King? I have not. You have a point of view about what's going to happen? Um, I, only that we will elect a speaker probably on the first day, and, um, and that it will be a member of the Republican Party, obviously, unless something really unusual happens in November. And, um, and I will say that all of the candidates that have filed up to this point, um, 
they could all be a speaker and they could all be good at it. You I would think. be comfortable I mean, with any of the, any of I the would, six Republicans I would be comfortable so with any of them that have filed so far and, um, and can work with any of them. And I've, I've told them all that have called me, and they all have pretty much. Yeah, I think all of them have talked to me at some point, and um, I just told them I was going to wait and see, you know, how it kind of shook out later on. See who else gets in the race. Yes, sir. Got it. Okay. Let's go to questions from the audience, Agnes. Is that okay? Uh, we have a microphone up here. We do not have a microphone over there. We have one. We do. Oh, we do. Okay. I just don't see a microphone there. Um, if you have a question, come on up to the front and ask it in the microphone if you would, and we'll bring you into the conversation. Of course, I've got more questions if, if you all don't have ones uh, to ask these two. Hi, how are you? Hello, I'm Dr. Hillary Gleason. I'm a professor here. I have a question regarding the budget. It's interesting to me how so very um, cemented in our discourse is this idea that you always have to cut. And you asked, okay, if you're going to fund education so much more, what are you going to cut? Why is it always you got to cut? Y'all are a taxing entity, okay? If my kid needs medical expenses, I cut where I can, but if I still don't have enough money to do what I got to do, I get a second job. Right. So I'm wondering why always the question is phrased, Good. where are you going to take from, instead of why don't we charge, say, the top 5% of families in Texas who ha take home 20% of the income, right. why don't they kick in a little bit more so the five-year-old can go to preschool? Okay, so this uh, movement conservative question, or just kidding. Um, <laughs> Uh, this, this, this is a good question, actually, and in, and in fact, I made the point to Chairman Raymond about cutting in response to what he said, which is, I don't think that we need more revenue. That was the premise that I was going off of when you said that. Well, I, no, I don't think I said that. I said that I don't believe we will get more revenue. Okay, I, or, so you... Or, or, or so let, me, let me be clear. Yeah, let please, me be clear and to answer her question. Please. Look, we, we, this is a, a legislature that is a majority Republicans, uh, and a governor who's Republican, lieutenant governor who's Republican, and um, I've been in 24 years. I've never voted for a tax increase. And I'm a Democrat. But would you vote for a tax? I guess. I, 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 we're, we're not going to, let me, let me tell you, we're not going to, we're not going to, in my opinion, we will not increase taxes. All right? So at the end of, at the, end of the day, uh, I guess you could go back to what Evan said a while ago, or maybe Tracy did. If, if you want people that are going to increase taxes, then vote for candidates that are going to increase taxes, okay? Right. But, but that's not what you have in the legislature right now. In the legislature you have, including myself, I haven't been convinced that there is a good tax increase to vote for, so I've never voted for one. Now, I can almost assure you with the majority of Republicans it's even less likely that we will have a tax increase, and so it does get back to priorities. In addition to that, the thought is that our economy continues to grow. As our co economy continues to grow, there will be more general revenue that comes in as a result of that. With that general revenue, then we can spend on other things. But at, but at some point, I get back to this. People are tired of getting taxed. I don't care if they're Democrat. I don't care if they're liberal, conservative, or somewhere in between. They're at the point where they're tired of being taxed. We're, we're getting a lot of tax dollars from people in the state of Texas, and we're doing a lot of things with them, and we're doing a lot of great things. But at some point, ya basta. So, so, let, so let's, let's stay with this for one second. So I, I heard you say we have Republican leadership in the state. We have a Republican legislature. We're not going to have any tax increases. Then I heard you say I've not seen a tax increase that I could support. So it's not just a political reality from your perspective that we're not going to have tax increases. You yourself don't believe that we need a tax increase. I, I, I don't believe we need one yet. I don't. I haven't. Right. I, you know, I'm, I'm like, a, I remember President, the first President Bush said, you know, you never say never. Right? right. Okay, you never say never. But I've never voted for one yet. But then you remember there was a discussion. tax increase late in his term, and that's why he lost in the, in the eyes of a lot of people, because he flip-flopped on that. Well... Remember, read what, what, my lips, this, no this new taxes? Happened. Well, all right, if you want to, the way I remember history is, he first said, um, you know, you never say never. And then when he got to the convention, when he was losing by a lot of points in the polls, he said, I will never, ever, right, read my lips, no right. new taxes. And then the next year, he voted for one of the largest tax increases. And in part, that is why he lost. 
There's no doubt about it. I, I'm, I'm trying to be honest and tell you, I've right. never voted for a tax increase. Okay. I haven't seen one that I want to vote for yet. Right. I, I can't tell you that I never will because I don't know. Well, let me ask Chairman King. So, Chairman King, we don't have a state income tax in Texas. That's a pretty popular position in most quarters, not to have a state income tax, not a very likely uh, scenario that we're going to ever go to a state income tax. But there are some taxes that people talk about, even Republicans talk about potentially raising. The gasoline tax is an example. We haven't had a gasoline tax increase in how long? 30 years? Something like that, right? yes, sir. So are there things that you would be willing to entertain, leaving the political reality, which I don't dispute Chairman Raymond on, of this legislature aside? Not a big appetite for tax increases. Is there anything you would entertain? You don't have an opponent. You can be honest. I'm going to be honest, But these too. answers are on record forever, <laughs> Evan. That's true. Is there anything you would entertain? Um, first of all, let me say, and I don't remember the numbers, but I think the state budget is probably twice what it was when I got there. So there is a lot more revenue coming in. Uh, yeah. Like Chairman Raymond said, I don't remember what the, what the budget was in 95, but I know what it is now, and it, it may be twice what it was in 95. So right. you can't say that there's not additional revenue coming in, because there is additional revenue coming in. But you bring up the gas tax. Um, I, I would, uh, if you were gonna, if you were gonna increase the gas tax and use it exclusively, exclusively, my friend, in order to improve the highways in House District 80 and no other district in the state of Texas. No. Uh, that's uh, what we call, we call that a carve uh, out, right? That's a carve out. If we were gonna use it exclusively for those purposes, I, I could support a, uh, an increase in the gas tax and it would be hard to fade whenever the election time came around, but you know, sometimes you, you just, uh, that's what you're here for. Right. As, as he said earlier, right. you know, if you're not willing to cast a hard vote, you might be in the wrong place. Now, you know, you both are, one more thing on this, you're both entering into a session where it's going to be the first post-Hurricane Harvey budget. The impact of the, of the storm on the communities affected, 22% of the state is north of $200 billion. A lot of that is to be paid by the federal government, but let, let us know when the check comes on that, right? There's a discussion of taking money out of the rainy day fund for at least a part of where the state's going to be responsible. This is gonna be a tough session, Chairman Raymond, is it not? If you're somebody looking to get money out of the state, this is not a time I'd wanna have my hand out before the state of Texas. Well, first of all, they're all tough sessions, okay? Right. And, and our hearts went out to all the folks who were affected by Hurricane Harvey. And yes, I believe that we, we will, the federal government will pay a lot of it. Uh, there will be obviously insurance companies that pay, that ought to be paying what they need to be paying. Uh, and, and I believe the state of Texas will have to step up and will. I think we'll use some of that from the rainy day fund. I can't tell you right now how much, because I don't know. We'll have right. a better idea once we get to January. You're, you're, you're not unreasonably worried, though, about what's going to happen. No. This is not going to be like a super bad, no. among the worst kind of session session. No, I, I don't think so at all. Yeah, Chairman, you feel the same way? I do, and, and you know, we'll know more the first week of January when the comptroller gives us the budget Re estimate. Revenue estimate. But, uh, but, you know, the comptroller up to this point has been sending us some good signals. And, um, and a lot of it's predicated, of course, on the price of oil and natural gas. But um, I which, think- Which is going up. Yes. Right. And so I, I am cautiously optimistic that we're gonna, from a budgetary standpoint, it's still gonna be a, a challenging session, but I think that the outlook is a little better now than it was six months ago, in my opinion. Fair, okay. Sir. Good, good afternoon, how y'all doing? I wanted to know what your position was on Governor Abbott's uh, bicentennial blueprint tax policy that he has. Sorry, say that again, sir. The governor, Governor Abbott has this tax policy that he issued, it's called the bicentennial blueprint, and it's, and it's regarding property taxation. Right. So I want to know what the representative's position was on that policy that he has. I, I, think, I think Chairman Raymond was talking about the governor's Well, that's a bill that I've, I've already ordered. I've been working so with Governor Abbott since, and his staff since last September, uh, and I and I, I know it's tough. He's proposing a 2.5 to remind people what he's proposing is that a city council and a commissioner's court could not increase their budget more than 2.5 percent every year, not including new growth. So if there's new growth and you get new revenue, that's not counted against that, and I think that's fair. Um, and, and so I support that. I ordered the bill, I've worked with him, I've sat with his staff several times by now, with Ledge Council, with John Caliandro, his policy director, and 
I think we've got to do something. The school part of it, as he has acknowledged, is more complicated. That'll be a separate bill. But anyway, that's, that's Well, that's I'm good. At. I'm glad you're supporting it because uh, taxes are, you know, out of control here locally. And uh, right. anything that you all can do to help at the state level would, would uh, right. definitely help. Thank now, you. are you, uh, you, you, work, you say you work well with Governor Abbott, yes. Ch Chairman Raymond. You work well with Governor Abbott's office, too? Uh, yes, sir, I do. Are you supporting Governor Abbott for re-election, or are you supporting Sheriff Valdez? I support uh, Sheriff Valdez and every Democrat. You support Democrat? Sure, I support the Democratic. So ticket. working well with the governor doesn't mean that you're entertaining supporting a Republican. Yeah, and he hadn't come down to campaign for either one of us either, by the way. Oh, is that right? No. Look, I mean, it's, I, I, uh, there's not a bigger Dallas Cowboys fan than me, right? There just isn't. But I think Ben Roethlisberger's a great quarterback. Yeah. And I like Ben Roethlisberger when the Steelers are playing the Ravens. I'm for the, but if they're playing the Cowboys, don't ever question who I'm going to be for. I'm going to be for the Cowboys. Right. And that's just the way. That's the so nature. Governor Abbott is Ben Roethlisberger? Is that he's Roethlisberger. I like him, and I like him, but, but you know, he's not a Dallas Cowboy. <laughs> okay. Okay. Maybe we'll take one more, sir. You can go up to the microphone, or you can use your outside voice if you like. Yeah, sir, if you want to ask one, too, you're welcome to. Sir? Yes. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, Buddy Earl, I'm the... Uh, Webb County, Texas Farm Bureau president here. Yes, sir. And I know both uh, Mr. Keene and Mr. Raymond. I have a two-part que or two sure. questions. But uh, the first one, uh, Mr. Keene, you have uh, rural counties. Uh, see if I get them all right. Freer, Uvalde, Savala, Zapata, and part of Webb, which are what, about 90, 95 percent rural, but it's only small pockets. And Mr. Raymond, you have Moreto, which is all urban on there. But in your case, Mr. Raymond, a lot of landowners live in Laredo, okay, but have their properties in Mr. Keene's area thing. So right. the question I have, being that I'm in Farm Bureau and always pushing for agriculture, is eminent domain. It's one of our biggest things that we're trying to pass on Texas right. Farm Bureau on there. And, you know, it's a high priority for Texas Farm Bureau and for our sales landowners and all. And I was just wondering if you were going to help co-sponsor either one of you a bill to get a better level playing field for landowners against the uh, big oil companies who come in there and basically strong arm right. and take over this type of thing if you're willing all to help sponsor. I know you're all both very good friends of Farm Bureau and always going for our policy. Let me, so, Chairman thing. King, this is a great question. Eminent domain is a big issue. It's not just oil companies, it's utility companies, it's high-speed rail. There are a lot of different entities yeah. that in some respect are in a conversation now about access to property for purposes that may benefit people uh, in the in the larger world. It's potential wall. It is. Don't it forget about the potential wall. Well, and, and of course the border wall. Right, the border wall. Right. I mean, you know, in the Senate race, you have uh, a, a political action committee supporting Senator Cruz, who is for the border wall, attacking Beto O'Rourke for being for eminent domain, <laughs> which seems a little strange. So. Um, where do we come down on this? The, the border wall is obviously a big part of this conversation. Well, I'm opposed. I'm opposed to a border wall, obviously, and uh, it's a, it's a third century solution to a 21st century problem, and so it's uh, it's it's a bad idea. But in eminent domain issues, I I think there's a place for eminent domain, and even the Farm Bureau and any of those organizations would argue it. But unfortunately, over the years, you've seen some groups um, abuse the eminent domain powers that they have, and thus you have this ongoing discussion and very controversial discussion about eminent domain, and I think there are some reforms that need in, in eminent domain, and I certainly support the Farm Bureau and their efforts to do that and look forward to continuing to do so. What, what, give us an example of one thing that you think should be different from the way that eminent domain is, uh, is played out of practice now. Well, one of the most common practices is that uh, you'll have an agent for pick an entity, any of them, will come in and give a lowball offer to a landowner who may not have the resources to go out and, and hire an appraiser and hire an attorney and those types of things in order to find out whether that's a legitimate offer or whether it's a lowball offer. And these agents get paid sometimes uh, based on how cheaply they get that land so that's acquired. So that's the problem with the level playing field, that property it, owners are at a disadvantage. It is not a case. level playing field in many right. instances. Right. Chairman Raymond. Well, my grandfather, Nesepero Pena, who was from Sark County, was a rancher all of my life and, and long before I was born. 
He didn't have a gigantic ranch, but that's what he lived off of. Uh, my other grandfather, A.D. Raymond, worked for Texaco for 45 years. So those are the two life experiences I had growing up. I'm very close to both of them. I love both of them very, very much. And, and it is a balance. But at the end of the day, I do think that landowners should come out we ought to look at them and their rights more than, than those that want to come in and take over their land that has been, in many instances, in their family for a generation, not only generations, but maybe even a century, right? So it's got to be a balance. It, it has to be, and as Chairman King pointed out, there are, yeah, getting a survey done, Evan, for just a couple of hundred acres, it's four or $5,000, right? you know, and then to try to get the appraisal done on top of that. I mean, so you've got to balance those things and make sure that I've wondered about, for example, on the wall, which, yes, we're, I'm opposed to the wall as well, a wall between Mexico and the United States. But I, I think about the eminent domain issue, what that would mean in terms of just trying to run over people that would absolutely not want that on their well, land. Well, in fact, we, we've done reporting on the last time this happened where there was an attempt to take land for uh, 10 years ago, and it went very badly, and it was complicated, and property owners found themselves in the crosshairs, and that may very well be the case again. So you both are willing to look at and, legislation. And we, and we need organizations like yep. the Farm Bureau. We need organizations like the Farm Bureau to get very engaged on this issue. We need you all to show right. up at the Capitol and talk to other legislators who may not, who may think that they, they don't have ranch land in their areas right. or their districts, but just like you pointed out, buddy, they have constituents who live in their districts or live in their towns that have either have land, own land out there, or have relatives who live out on that land. We need you guys to get more engaged. Everyone's more affected by it, right. Let's take one more question. Dr. Solis. Yes, thank you. Uh, I know this is a very touchy subject, but here in Laredo, we're very honored to have you here, and especially at the higher education institutions. Yeah. Uh, we have a dilemma where continuously we're being requested to increase our output, student outcomes, yes, graduation rate, et cetera. And then, of course, the economy is at the best, at the highest, uh, the, the growth, unemployment rate. But constantly, we're being asked to produce more. But at the same time, we continuously get the threat of reducing or cutting, as it was asked earlier, the right. budget for education. And we are the solution for the workforce and the skills. And what better place to discuss is I know we're running out of time. But uh, we, are, we are very excited to continue this dialogue on the role of higher education. Right. But at the same time, we would like to hear the, the view, what are your considerations, what's going to happen with these budget cuts in education? Right. Because it, the demands are getting higher, and we have to produce more but with less. Right. And that's a concern. We have here the president of, of TAMIU as well, and we're really anxious. Uh, Dr. Arenas, thank you for coming. And Yes, sir. Uh, we, so, we are united to provide education, but we cannot increase right. tuition. We certainly do not want to increase taxes. All right, so let's go, let's go yeah. there, Chairman Raymond. This is a good place yeah. to end. We talked about how public education has seen a cut at the state level. The state's share of public ed funding is down from where it was. To Dr. Solis' point, the state's share of higher ed funding is also down from where it was. And as property taxpayers are being asked to pick up the tab for public ed, students and families are being asked to pick up the tab for higher ed. Why won't you guys fund higher ed adequately? Well, again, if you, want to be in the, if you want to be in the legislature, it's not getting, each session doesn't get easier. It gets, it, it does get harder. They're all complicated. But it seems as though each, each year they get more complicated. And what we should be doing when we're working, looking at the budget is taking a hard look at where we invest dollars. President Clinton talked, he was the first president really to talk about investing when he talked about spending money. He said, let's invest dollars. So when you look at, Community colleges all over the state of Texas. We're very proud of the one here in Laredo. But when you look at community colleges and, Texas and technical schools across the state of Texas, when we're sitting there figuring out what the priority should be on the budget, we should look at what, this, what is this investment getting us? Yep. Okay? We look at that. Here in Laredo, what Laredo College has meant to our economy in terms of providing for the workforce that we have here in, in, in Laredo, it's tremendous. It may not be the same in other areas of the state. I couldn't tell you. But, I, but I'm sure that there are many communities where the community college is such an important part of the economy and growing that economy and preparing the workforce. When it comes to the technical schools, for example, I remember maybe two, three years ago, I'm in Mexico City. I sit down with the largest job, employ uh, the largest job placement agency in the country. 
he brings in one of his clients who's an American company. They sit down with me and they say, I said, you didn't have to come meet me here. I'd have met you in Corpus Christi. They're from Corpus Christi. He said, we legally brought in 800 welders, 800 welders from Mexico with visas to do the work we needed in Corpus Christi because we didn't have enough welders in the state of Texas. Right. They brought in 800. So let's look at where we, when we invest money, let's look what the return is. And clearly, when you look at Laredo College, and I, I'm guessing a lot of community colleges across the state of Texas, that the return on that investment right. is really good. Chairman King, last word on this. What do you think about higher ed funding and the prospects for next session? Well, I, I think they absolutely need to do more. And uh, I'm blessed to have two wonderful uh, Laredo College and Southwest Texas Junior College up in, in the northern part of the district, and not to mention A&M International University here that do a great job and deserve more funding. Uh, the challenge always is, is that um, you know, in healthcare, every now and then there's a lawsuit comes around, and foster care, there's every now and then there's right. a lawsuit comes around, and public ed, there was a big lawsuit a few years ago with prison funding. There'll be a lawsuit come around. Um, um, higher ed, God bless them, they don't have any lawsuits defending them, right. and so uh, that's one of the political challenges that we face. But there is no question that the best bang for the buck is in, uh, in, in community colleges and in universities like A&M. Yep. They provide wonderful outreach here on the ground. Okay, so the lesson is sue the state. <laughs> That's what I'm taking away from this, sue the state. Uh, Chairman King, Chairman Raymond, thank you so much for being here today. Thank to you, Dr. Everybody. Solis and everybody at Laredo College, thank you. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you again. Appreciate it. Thank you.